Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Kruger, and I am here to welcome you uh, both in person and virtually on behalf of uh, Dean Jean King and the School of Arts and Sciences to our third annual Social Justice Summit at WPI. Um, this is, uh, as I just said, it's our third year um, doing this summit. Um, and you know, a few of us have been talking about doing it for a long time. And, uh, and finally, two years ago, with the change of leadership, uh, we were able to, to get it done. And we were surprised, pleasantly surprised, how many people showed, out for, showed up for it. About 125, 150 people rolled in. It was organized by Dean King and uh, then the department head of uh, social sciences, Emily Douglas. Um, and I've just been struck over the last few years how this message has permeated so many parts of uh, our culture at WPI. Um, things that used to be uh, uh, allowed are now called out uh, as a matter of course. Um, when we think about science and technology, social justice is right there with it. When we think about the implications of science and technology uh, for society, social justice is right there with us. And it comes in a variety of forms, whether it's generative justice, uh, design justice, or a variety of other things. It's right there and it informs uh, what we do. And part of that is uh, a result of this um, uh, summit that we have each year. So we are gonna be here until five o'clock today with a full afternoon of events and activities and talks. Uh, and then we'll re uh, uh, arrive here again in the morning from nine to noon and have a uh, round table on um, mobility justice and uh, a couple of panel sessions. So we're really looking forward to the next uh, few hours. And before I continue, I would like to introduce our provost, Wally Sobiejo, uh, to uh, provide a few words for us. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I have to say, uh, for me, it's really a pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, Social Justice Summit and uh, to express my appreciation to Dean King, um, Rob Kruger for his introduction, and also to Lorraine Elgert, Eunice Talil, and Rebecca Wallet and the whole staff that have made this uh, summit possible. So I've been at WPI for five years, and it's amazing how WPI has changed in five years. I, I remember, I think, when people started talking about social justice and they would get a strange look, and, you know, sort of minor frowns and lack of understanding. So I compare this to what I call the three stages of a good idea. So in the first stage, nobody knows what we're talking about. And uh, I'm afraid we were there probably five years ago, um, where the words social justice would cause people to look at you and wonder you know, what you're talking about. In the second stage, a few people, perhaps your spouse, who has to listen to you, <laughs> as people that are very close to you really get it because you've been talking about it, but the rest of the world doesn't get it. In the third stage, of course, it was their idea all along. And, and I think we are at the third stage in a very strange way in this idea of social justice where everybody today has a sense of real consciousness of the need for social justice in almost every facet of life. And, and this has certainly happened here at WPI, where really all the way from the faculty, the students, the staff, to the administration and the board, there's an appreciation of this new world where social justice really matters. So like every good idea, I think, it has emerged 
But I think our community here, those that are here and those that are on Zoom, not only get it, they feel it like artists and they've responded in ways that have resulted in an initiative. And how is it possible that one could not feel it when you watch some of the things that have happened, such as the murder of George Floyd, which heightened the sensitivities in terms of racial justice and led us to re-examine what we do in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion as ways of addressing some of the inequities in the distribution of positions, wealth, opportunity, and privileges in our society. However, this goes well beyond America. It is truly a global issue. And it is one that connects to STEM, especially a world in which technology and artificial intelligence race ahead in ways that do not necessarily connect to equity. A global challenge is where many parts of the world are witnessing the migration of people in ways that also lead us to ask serious questions about social justice. And I say that when you frame the questions and the answers within the lens of social justice, you begin to think in multiple ways that enable us to begin to address those challenges. And so I'm really excited to see some of the keynotes that will be speaking at this summit. Uh, Meredith Broussard of NYU, I'm tickled by the idea of artificial unintelligence. <laughs> and we look forward to your insights in this area. Uh, our own Mimi Shella, the Dean of the Global School, um, will be talking about uh, uh, mobilities and social justice. And, and not only Mimi is interested in this, we have a whole community of people here at WPI that will be going through a roundtable discussion and highlighting uh, diverse ways of thinking of these issues of mobilities and, and social justice. So as we look forward to the next few days of discussion, roundtable interaction, storytelling, um, I'm really excited and appreciative about what WPI is becoming thanks to arts and sciences. And, and I want to make a confession before I leave, you know. So one of the things that happened to me when I finished my PhD is that I went to work in industry and I was paid well. I had a great job doing research, but I missed the universities. I missed the free spirit, the discussions, the open interactions, sessions like this, where you come and you listen to ideas and people really have higher ideals for society than just what industry has to offer. And I think what you're doing at this Arts and Sciences Week and in programs such as this is to kind of organize the kind of activities that make universities truly places that are centers of thought. They're the reason why I left industry to come back to academia. And they're the reasons why I think we're lucky enough to be in what I think is the very best university in the heart of the Midwest, in, in the heart of New England. And so thanks to everybody that has worked so hard to make this possible, that is now making this a tradition in WPI. I really look forward to, to the days ahead and the ideas, the exchanges, and the outcomes of this forum. Thank you. I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, Professor Oyewa and uh, Dean King for their support in faculty initiatives um, that aim to like explore, you know, uh, issues of social justice in STEM. Uh, we really appreciate their support. Um, thank you so much. Um, and um, so it's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Meredith Broussard. 
Uh, Dr. Bursart is, a, um, is an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter uh, Journalism Institute of New York University. She's one of the most important voices in critical technology studies in the United States. Her uh, 2018 book, Artificial Intelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, uh, published by MIT Press, has received the American Publishers Association's Pose Award in the Computing and Information Sciences. Before starting her position at NYU, uh, Dr. Bursart was a data journalist at the Philadelphia Inquirer. She has also worked as a full software developer at AT&T Bell Labs and uh, at the MIT Media Lab. Her um, features and essays have appeared in uh, many uh, journals and magazines, including The Atlantic, Harper's Slate, um, and other places. Uh, she appeared in the uh, critically acclaimed and well-received documentary, Coded Bias, and some of you might remember that um, last year, uh, WPI's Public Interest Technology Initiative had a screening of the documentary, followed by an interview with the director and producer, Shalini Kantaya. Um, in her work, Dr. Bursard directs our attention to the gap between our fascination with the premise and promise of new technologies and the actual practices and institutions of technology design and development. Her work is timely given that in current tech culture, we tend to focus on the next frontier, the next big thing, and oftentimes don't ask the difficult questions about inequities and injustices and social crises that exist right now, right here in our society. Dr. Bustard's work um, connects multiple worlds, from the world of programmers to journalism, from data science to social justice, from digital humanities to AI research. And being able to travel across multiple worlds, multiple fields of knowledge and expertise, Dr. Bussard's work is astonishingly generous and generative. And I say this as someone who taught her book, Artificial and Intelligence, I witnessed how the engineering majors who read and engaged with her book in my humanities seminar were both challenged and encouraged. Challenged in terms of their assumptions about the role and place of technology in solving our social problems. They were challenged by the fact that all social, not all social problems require technological fixes. And even sometimes technological fixes make our problems worse. But they were also encouraged, encouraged that there are alternative ways of designing, developing, and deploying technologies. The awareness of such alternative ways, they told me, have empowered them not as experts of some sort, but as human beings who have to you know, share the world, who have to acknowledge that they share the world with people with and without their um, social and economic background. So for my, for my students in the seminar, and you know, uh, all of them have become extremely talented engineers and scientists, of course, the biggest lesson from uh, Dr. Bursar's book was that our critique of technology isn't just about the kind of machine learning algorithm or the kind of robot that can be too low. But more importantly, our critique of technology, our questions about new technologies are about the kind of society we want to live in, the kind of future, the version of the future that we envision for our society as a whole. This of course relates to one of the most you know, fundamental questions in the study of ethics, should we do it just because we can? And Dr. Broussard's work reminds us that this question is more prominent and more important today than ever, as current technologies have capacities that can greatly impact the well being of our communities and us as individuals for the better or worse. And this question is central to the Public Interest Technology Initiative here at WPI. We think that a better future for everyone is only possible by a social justice centered critique of science and technology. And in order to create a better future, we need to attend to the inequities and injustices in the present. So for this reason, we are extremely fortunate to have one of the leading voices in the study of public interest technology and social justice. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Meredith Broussard. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And it's great to kick off uh, WPI Social Justice Summit with your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Eunice, that was just an amazing introduction. I'm so grateful to you uh, for that. Uh, I'd like to thank the provost for a lovely introduction. I'd like to thank uh, everyone at WPI, especially Dean King, uh, 
Lorraine, Eunice, Rob, Rebecca, and the staff at Arts and Sciences. Uh, so it is such an honor to be with you today. Uh, and what we're gonna talk about today is public interest technology, artificial intelligence, and social justice. Uh, Eunice, you mentioned that our, our critiques uh, and our work in public interest technology has to be centered around social justice. I could not agree more. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about how I see all of these three things fitting together. Uh, so if you'll pardon me for a moment, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, here we go. I'll assume that this is looking amazing uh, on, uh, on screen for all of you. The first thing I wanna start with is I wanna start with what AI is and what AI is not. So here we have Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator and this is not AI. So there are a lot of uh, Hollywood images of AI that are embedded really deep in our consciousness. Uh, and it's very important to distinguish between the real and the imaginary when we're talking about AI. Uh, we are not under any imminent threat from sentient robots. Uh, definitely autonomous weapons are an imminent threat. But uh, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we need to be realistic about what exists and what doesn't exist. Uh, so we need to shy away from imaginary potential harms from an imaginary future. These are interesting, they're fun to debate, but they're not business critical. What we need to focus on are present harms to real people. And I like to make the distinction between real and imaginary AI uh, by looking at the distinction between narrow and general AI. So general AI is the Terminator. It's all of the Hollywood stuff, it is the sentient robots that are gonna take over the world. It's the paperclip machine that's going to make so many paperclips. It's going to just carry out its imperative and drown us all in paperclips. Uh, none of this is, uh, is realistic. Uh, and what's real about AI is what we call narrow AI. And narrow AI is just math. Uh, it is really complicated and beautiful math, but is ultimately just math it is computational statistics, computational statistics on steroids. So this is our starting point. This is where we, uh, where I proceed from. And when we're talking about uh, AI, we also need to talk about fairness. And when I think about fairness, I like to start with a cookie, maybe a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, and when I was a kid and there would be one cookie left, my little brother and I would fight over who got the last cookie. And a computer, if a computer is looking at this problem, the computer is going to say, all right, well, the mathematically fair thing is to divide the cookie in half and each child gets 50%. And yes, that is absolutely fair. But in the real world, when you divide a cookie, there is a big half and a little half. And my little brother and I would fight over <laughs> the big half and the little half. Uh, so if I wanted the big half, I would say to my brother, okay, if you let me have the big half now, uh, I will let you pick the television program that we're going to watch on TV after dinner. And my brother would think about it for a second. He would say, yes, that seems fine. That seems fair. And so everybody would be happy. And this was a socially fair decision. So that we are operating with two different sets of values here. Mathematical fairness is not the same as social fairness, and we shouldn't expect them to be the same. So this is why we run into so many problems when we try and use mathematical solutions to fix social problems, because these are two different systems of symbolic logic. And proceeding from this, if we make things fair, we are not necessarily making things just. So fairness is not the same as justice and mathematical fairness is not the same as social justice. We need to consider these two things separately, mathematical fairness and social justice. And so this brings us to a conversation about AI ethics. And I wanna pause for a moment to consider what do we mean by AI ethics? Well, it's a complicated field. It's a little amorphous because it's new. 
Uh, but really what we're talking about in the field of AI ethics is we're looking at how does the AI make decisions. We're talking about holding the AI accountable. And we're also talking about whether to use AI at all. And that is a conversation that needs to happen a little bit more often than it is right now. I like to use a frame that is uh, offered by Ruha Benjamin in her book, Race After Technology. And this is the idea that AI and automated systems discriminate by default. So for many years, we were told that it was going to be better to use computational systems, that this was going to deliver us from all the messy problems of humanity. And it turns out that that's not true. So there was a common perception that AI is objective or unbiased. And when we let go of this perception, it becomes easier to see how the problems of the past are reflected in the data that we use to train our AI systems. So the problems of the past are things like discrimination, racism, sexism, ableism, all kinds of structural inequality. All of those things exist in the data that we are using to create the models that are the core of our AI systems. And all of those problems get replicated. There's no such thing as perfect data. And in fact, there's no such thing as debiasing the data. We can't just find a more perfect data set and then we can go ahead and use AI with impunity. It just doesn't work like that. So I wanna talk right now about a few examples of AI discrimination. Uh, and I have to apologize. I just got an alert saying that my computer is about to run out of power, which has never happened to me before on a talk. But if you'll just hold on for one moment, I'm gonna grab the power strip so we don't get disconnected. All right, my sincere apologies, but now we will be certain to be together for the remainder of our time together. All right, so a couple of examples of AI discrimination are up here. Uh, we've got a story by The Markup, which covers the secret bias hidden in mortgage approval algorithms. Nationally, The Markup found that applicants of color were 40 to 80% more likely to be denied mortgages than their white counterparts. And in certain metro areas, the disparity was greater than 250%. So these algorithms are not more objective. They're not more neutral. They're not unbiased. They are replicating existing structural inequalities because the U.S. has a history of discrimination, of residential discrimination. Uh, in fact, the U.S. is so segregated that zip code is a proxy for race. So a lot of these AI systems were built very naively and zip code data was put in as a, uh, as a factor that good, went into the model. And when you are factoring in zip code, you're also factoring in race. I also have up here the Gender Shades Project, uh, which if you saw Coded Bias, uh, you know about Joy Bolomwini and her groundbreaking work in facial recognition. Uh, she worked with Timnit Gebru and Deb Raji on gender shades, and they found that facial recognition works better on men than on women. It works better on people with light skin than people with dark skin. Uh, it works best of all on white men. It works worst of all on black women. And there's so many things that are important about the gender shades analysis. Uh, you know, the idea that we can audit systems, uh, the idea that intersectional auditing uh, is a productive mode of inquiry. Uh, but my, my kind of, the, the thing that really resonated with me was the way that Joy Bonomini took the work a step further, because a lot of people would look at this work and say, oh, well, clearly the problem is that we have too many, say, light-skinned men in the training data set. We'll just put more people with darker skin or a greater range of skin colors into the training data, and then we will retrain the models, and that will fix the problem. 
right? So more diversity of facial images will solve the problem and then the image rec the facial recognition will work better and we will la 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 go along our way. That is not the solution that Joy Bolomwini advocates for. She says, listen, let's take a step back and think about what the heck we're doing in the first place. Facial recognition systems are disproportionately weaponized against vulnerable communities, against communities of color, against poor communities. And the solution here is not to make the algorithms better, it's to not use facial recognition in policing at all, right? So the computer is not the solution. And this is the, uh, this is the point where, uh, where we are right now in thinking about social justice and technology. Now, the idea that AI would be better than humans is an idea that I call techno-chauvinism. Techno-chauvinism is the idea that technology is superior uh, to other solutions. And what I would argue instead is that it's about what is the right tool for the task. Sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer. Sometimes it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on a parent's lap. One is not inherently better than the other. It's about using the right tool for the task. And when we break it down a little bit further, when we start thinking about it, uh, the claim that technology is better than people is actually a claim that math is better than people. Because what do computers do? Computers are machines that compute, that calculate. Right? They're machines that do math. And who gave us this idea that math is better than people? The tech is better than people. Well, it turns out that this idea comes from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Most of our ideas about what the future is going to be like, robots, technology taking over, et cetera, et cetera, most of it comes from a small and homogeneous group of people. Uh, and I have a couple of them up on the screen here. We've got uh, Alan Turing, we've got Marvin Minsky, the father of artificial intelligence, we've got John von Neumann, we've got Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And you notice that what these folks have in common is that they are all mathematicians, right? They are all white male, Ivy League, Oxbridge trained mathematicians, which is fine. Some of my best friends are white male, Ivy League educated. <laughs> mathematicians. But the problem is that when you have a small and homogeneous group of people giving us these ideas, uh, inevitably people embed their own biases in technology. So the biases of this small elite group of mathematicians from, you know, from certain institutions uh, are the collective blind spots in technology. So what you need in order to really address a wide range of concerns, what you need in order to have diversity in technology is you need to have a diverse group of people in the room creating technology, conceptualizing technology. And we need to go further in our thinking about possible technological futures beyond what's been given to us already. And we need to seek out uh, different maybe indigenous visions of the future. One of the ways that you see uh, techno-chauvinism and the collective blind spots manifest uh, is in something called the Good Selfie Experiment. Uh, this was a graduate school project of uh, the current head of AI at Tesla. And what they set out to do here was to uh, determine mathematically what makes a good selfie. So they took a bunch of selfies, uh, a bunch of you know, open data that had been tagged selfie and sorted through them and had human beings tag what was good and what was bad, and then built a computer model uh, based on the human tagging and uh, then had the computer autonomously determine what was a good selfie. So here's what the computer came up with. These are the top 100 females in the good selfie experiment. And these are the top 100 males in the good selfie experiment. So you can see that 
these are remarkably homogeneous images. They are pretty much uh, heteronormative, cisgender, mostly white. Uh, this is not actually reflecting the full spectrum of human beauty or of human identity. Another way we see unconscious bias uh, manifesting inside math and thus inside computer science, which is descendant of math, uh, is we can look at the percent of female members of the American Mathematical Society residing in the US between 1985 and 2016. Uh, so as I said, all the early computer scientists trained as mathematicians, computer science is a descendant of mathematics uh, and AI, I should say, is a subfield of computer science, the same way that algebra is subfield of mathematics. Uh, so we need to kind of parse out the uh, systems of knowledge that are at work uh, and are underlying the claims made by researchers in these fields, All right? So let's back it up a little bit. What's going on in math departments? Uh, what's going on in the American Mathematical Society? Well, it looks like AMS has never managed to crack 20% in terms of women members in the United States uh, in the span of time represented here, right? Math is not a place that is friendly to women. Uh, math is not a field that has reckoned with the sins of its past. And so this is a blind spot that is uh, accepted inside the field of mathematics, more or less. Uh, it's something that a lot of mathematicians and computer scientists are trained to accept as normal. And it's something that is then embedded in the technology made by the people who are trained inside the system. So we need to disrupt that. What's another way it manifests? Well, Marvin Minsky, uh, who I write a whole chapter about in Artificial Unintelligence, Marvin Minsky is widely considered the father of artificial intelligence, uh, but Minsky is implicated in the Epstein scandal. Uh, we know that half of women in science experience harassment. So there are structural problems inside the fields that get replicated inside the technology and lead to collective blood spots. We can see bias in word embedding. Word embedding is one of the fundamental technologies underlying Google search. Uh, so we can see that there are associations between words. Uh, these are mathematical associations. And so when you look at occupations and you look at occupations that are associated with the word she, you get homemaker, librarian, nanny, housekeeper. When you look at occupations that are associated with he, you get maestro, philosopher, financier, warrior, boss. And you don't see this when you're doing a Google search. You don't see the 250 different uh, machine learning models that are being activated every time you do a search. You don't see that this is happening, but this is happening. Uh, and writ large, this is the kind of problem that leads to what I, Sophia Noble writes about in Algorithms of Oppression, why Google search results are racist. Uh, and I should also congratulate Sophia Noble on her 2021 MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, another uh, example of bias for you, just to layer on another one, uh, is found in the Apple Watch. So when the Apple Watch launched, it did not have a period tracker. Now, half of the people out there track their menstrual cycle. And so if you were really doing the Apple Watch as equitable technology, you would launch it with a period tracker as a default that you have to take off. Uh, if you don't need it. Uh, and instead, what they did with the initial launch of the Apple Watch was they said, oh, we have all these great health apps, but they did not have a really fundamental health app. Uh, had they had more people in the room for whom a menstrual cycle matters, perhaps the decision would have been different. 
So one of the things that we need to think about also is we need to think about funding reality versus fantasy. And what has happened in the past around AI is that fantasies have been funded instead of reality being funded. So one example that I, uh, that I refer to a lot is the example of the space elevator. Uh, Marvin Minsky and some cronies uh, came up with it. Oh, and the uh, science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, who wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, came up with the idea of making an elevator to outer space. And they got a whole pile of government money and they spent six months in a nuclear research lab working on ideas about a space elevator. And I mean, it just, it, it boggles the mind. I mean, first of all, I will happily talk about space elevators and talk about the hypothetical physics of a space elevator, but it does not make a lot of sense to spend real taxpayer dollars on making a space elevator. So maybe you're depressed now. Maybe you're saying, okay, well, what can we do? And fortunately, I have an answer for you. You ready? You can read my book. Okay, uh, that's step one. Step two is we can think about public interest technology. Uh, so I am the research director for the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. We've been gathered here today uh, under the uh, you know, the good graces of the WPI Public Interest Technology Initiative. Public interest technology is a growing field and it is absolutely the place that you wanna be uh, if you are interested in the intersection of technology and social justice and you wanna build technology or make technology policy for public good, okay? So as you build public interest technology or as you make tech policy, one of the things you can do is you can pay attention to social justice issues. You can pay attention to AI ethics while you're building these new technologies. Uh, sometimes public interest tech, tech is about building new things. Sometimes it's about updating things that already exist or uh, redoing existing technology, which is not necessarily glamorous, but is incredible incredibly necessary. Uh, and NYU and WPI both belong to the Public Interest Technology University Network, uh, which is a partnership of universities and has lots of opportunities for students. So students, uh, if you're interested in getting more into the field, uh, there's a career fair coming up at NYU called uh, A Better Tech, uh, and it's sponsored by Pitt UN. Uh, and so uh, I hope that uh, I hope that leads to uh, something that you like. Another idea I think that we need to keep in mind is the idea that using technology is not inherently liberating. In fact, often the opposite is true. So there's this techno chauvinist fantasy that, okay, we're going to be able to replace real world processes with a technological process. And because we're doing it on the, on the computer, it's going to be more fair you know, or more objective or more neutral or more unbiased or blah, blah, blah. I, we need to really examine that belief. And in fact, what we should be doing when we computerize processes is we should run a parallel human process. And we should look at the computational process, we should look at the human process, and we should really evaluate which one is working really well. And we should not eliminate the human process until or unless the computational process is actually working better. And what happens a lot of the time is people jump the gun and they say, all right, I have a new computer system and I'm gonna be able to fire all the people who I, you know, are very expensive and work here and I'm just gonna replace them with a computer with automation. And that is almost always a bad idea uh, because you haven't thought about all of the things that could go wrong. You haven't thought about all the unintended consequences and you haven't thought about the people who are going to be excluded once you turn over the processes entirely. So we're not going to be able to replace people entirely with computers. Right? That is a techno chauvinist fantasy. Uh, it is super interesting to talk about, but it's not real. 
And in terms of what is going well, AI legislation and the current thinking about regulating AI is a really good start. So in the EU, uh, there is a new proposed uh, set of AI regulation that categorizes AI into high risk and low risk. And so low risk AI is stuff like the facial recognition that you would use to open up your phone, which doesn't work well with a mask on, but is pretty inoffensive. High risk is something like facial recognition used in policing, facial recognition used on real-time surveillance data. Uh, and so the high risk AI would have to be regulated, uh, would have to be registered and would have to be checked by regulators regularly to find out if it is discriminating or not. And if it is discriminating, then it should not be used. Again, we go back to our frame that discrimination is the default inside automated systems. So if we start looking for the problems, we're gonna find them because they're there. In the US, uh, we have some really exciting uh, policy suggestions coming up. Uh, there is the Algorithmic Accountability Act uh, that has been kicking around for a little while now. Uh, NIST has put out uh, some standards and statements on you know, what is AI, what do we need to be looking for? Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has put out guidance saying, if you are using an AI, it has to obey the law. Uh, and these are all steps in the right direction. It's actually kind of shocking that uh, for the entire, you know, multiple decades that we've had the internet, that we've had computers, that people building computer systems have not bothered to check whether their systems are obeying the law, uh, are operating within the law. Uh, but we are finally getting to that point. I'm really interested in something called a regulatory sandbox. This is something that is part of the uh, EU's AI regulation. Uh, and a regulatory sandbox is uh, a sandbox, a playground, where an AI or a model can run and can be evaluated by its creator and also evaluated by regulators. Uh, so this is something that's called for in the legislation and I'm actually developing one right now with Orca, which is Kathy O'Neill's uh, company. Kathy O'Neill, of course, is the author of Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, which is one of the books that really kicked off our entire conversation about AI ethics. Another thing you can do as a public interest technologist or as somebody working inside big tech or as a thinking human is you can look for human problems inside technological systems. If you feel like you don't know enough about humans to understand human problems, if you don't, if, you know, uh, if you don't know how to identify discrimination or prejudice or ableism or inequality or medical racism, that's okay, you don't have to know all these things. You can collaborate. So you can collaborate with humanists, with social scientists. Uh, we think all day, every day about inequality and how to recognize it. And uh, again, nobody can know everything. And so collaboration, cross-disciplinary collaboration is really important. Uh, and you can also test your technology for accessibility. Uh, accessibility is something that we're talking about a lot more nowadays, uh, and it is it is pretty shocking that we haven't been, uh, this hasn't been a mainstream part of the conversation uh, until now, but it's very important. And so you can learn more about what does it take to make technology accessible? What do you have to do? Another thing you can think about is AI governance policy. All right, so for the, uh, the policy wonks in the room, uh, AI governance policy uh, should be developed inside an organization. Uh, there's a framework that's published by Equal AI. Equal AI does a really terrific badge program uh, that educates, uh, educates people about uh, not only what is AI, what are the possible biases inside AI, but how do you develop it? AI governance policy. Uh, and so the Equal AI framework that I have up on the screen here uh, looks at how to combat bias in AI. So there's five pillars. Uh, these pillars include invest in the pipeline, 
hire and promote with your values, evaluate your data, test your AI, and redefine the team. So we've got a lot of elements going on here. We've got the importance of a diverse team building technology, and we've got the recognition that the AI is gonna have problems. The AI is not gonna be perfect. Uh, and as, you know, as a company deploying AI, we're going to need to put some guardrails in place. Other questions you can ask uh, as you are developing your AI governance policy or as you're developing an AI system are how representative is the data set? Does the data model account for biases? Probably not. And how accurate are the predictions? So you can do an intersectional analysis. You can audit your algorithms to find out how are they doing with different groups of people. There are a lot of audit and governance resources out there. Uh, and when I started writing about this stuff in, uh, well, many years ago now, uh, when I started writing about this stuff, there weren't that many resources out there. And now there's been an explosion of audit and governance resources, which is just fantastic. Uh, start with Orca, start with Equal AI, start with the Algorithmic Justice League, which is Joy Bolomini's organization. They also do, uh, they also do audits. Uh, as I said, I'm involved in the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. We have something called the Algorithmic Advisory Alliance, uh, where we help organizations to develop data governance policies. We do custom executive education uh, around algorithms, data ethics, AI, uh, and we help people understand what are the potential bias issues inside algorithms. Parity is up here as another resource. Uh, it's getparity.ai is a company that was started by Ruman Chowdhury, uh, currently running uh, fairness initiatives at Twitter. Uh, and there's also, if you want to get really into the weeds, the scholarly work around this topic is centered at the ACM FACT conference. So that's the ACM conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency. Uh, that has computer scientists, mathematicians, lawyers, social scientists, all coming together doing interdisciplinary work on fairness and what does this really look like in terms of policy? What does it look like mathematically? Uh, there are uh, something like 21 different definitions of mathematical fairness uh, that are out there right now. Uh, in the fact world, they are mostly mutually exclusive. So one of the things you need to do uh, when you're looking at an algorithm, because again, computers are machines that do math, an algorithm is a set of steps, a process that the computer goes through in order to drive a mathematical result. Uh, and so you need to implement a mathematical measure of fairness if you're going to audit an algorithm. And so you have to pick which definition of fairness. Now we're back to the idea that mathematical fairness is not the same as social justice. So you need to be really clear about your goals and about your, uh, about your milestones when you are evaluating an algorithm. Another thing you can do is you can learn from journalists on the algorithmic accountability beat. I already mentioned the markup. Uh, they are doing great work with algorithmic accountability reporting. Uh, so is ProPublica, uh, ICIJ, uh, who did the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. They've done some really great work on uh, analyzing leaked documents and also making the leaked documents available to the public as a database. And that reporting project has resulted in dozens upon dozens of uh, prosecutions globally. And finally, the New York Times is also doing some really amazing work on the algorithmic accountability beat. Increasingly, uh, algorithms are being used to make decisions on our behalf. One of the things that the media does, one of the traditional functions of the media is accountability, holding decision makers accountable. So algorithms and their makers also need to be held accountable. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about algorithmic accountability reporting. And the final thing that I wanna talk about is uh, what can you read, what can you watch, what can you listen to in order to learn more? Of course, I'm a professor, I'm gonna leave you with a syllabus, I'm gonna leave you the reading list. 
Okay. Uh, maybe you want to start with artificial intelligence. I don't know. Uh, you can read data feminism, weapons of math destruction, black software, automating inequality, Brotopia, design justice, algorithms of oppression, behind the screen, programmed inequality, Twitter and tear gas, or technically wrong. Uh, you can also watch coded bias. And the final thing I wanna leave you with is the idea that implementing AI ethics, whether it's inside public interest technology, whether it's inside for-profit technology, uh, anywhere, implementing AI ethics and getting us toward a place of greater social justice starts with education. Uh, we need to talk more about how AI is not the Hollywood stuff. This is a very real mathematical process. It's hard to understand. It takes a little bit of work, but it can be done. Uh, we need to educate people how individual algorithms work in addition to how, you know, how computers work overall, how you know, we need to increase computational literacy, but we need to talk about specific algorithms. We need to stop pretending that computers are magic that when something happens with AI, that it can't be understood. It can be understood. Uh, and we need to start talking more about how these things work and whether they are actually consistent with the world that we want to create. Because when AI discriminates by default, what it's doing is it's replicating all of the problems and the sins of the past. And if we just keep doing the things that we have done in the past, it's not going to get us toward a collectively better future. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing now. And I believe that we have time for some questions. All right. It looks like we have uh, one, one question in the chat, it says, uh, oh, okay, there's a bunch of questions here. They're all piled up. Okay. Um, Meredith, where do you see the questions? Uh, I'm looking in the Q&A. Okay. So should I read the question out so that the audience here can can see what, what it is? Maybe you can read it also, but I'll just read it out. And then Meredith, I'll leave you to respond. Okay. So um, John Sambomatsu asks the following question. Thanks for that wonderfully insightful talk. Could you say a little about the political implications of having personal digital services like Siri and Alexa impersonate female voices? The UN has flagged these as damaging to women and girls. Also, could you speak to the undemocratic nature of all technological decision-making under capitalism? You note the importance of identity and social group in social justice. However, technological development is not in the hands of ordinary people, but in the hands of powerful and unscrupulous corporations and wealthy individuals. How likely is it that a regulatory sandbox or AI governance policy will actually work when the Congress is effectively controlled by corporate lobbyists, especially the military industrial complex? All right, so that is a whole lot of questions piled up on each other. I took some notes, so let me, uh, let me try and tackle a few of these. Uh, so the uh, political implications of female voices. We definitely need to talk about this. Uh, Siri and Alexa are servants. They are digital servants. Uh, they are subservient and they are female. And then when you look at the computers that are uh, coded as powerful, like Watson, you know, which uh, defeated uh, Ken Jennings, I think it was Ken Jennings, the Jeopardy champion. Uh, and Deep Blue, which is the uh, computer that defeated the best chess master in the world, uh, those computers are coded as male, right? So the servant computers are coded as female and the powerful computers are coded as male. Uh, 
it's just about sexism. And the people making these things need to do better. Uh, I think it's not hard to figure out where this bias comes from. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, the gender problems inside math. They're shared by uh, computer science. Uh, if you look at the uh, composition of the workforce in Silicon Valley, uh, they keep saying, oh, you know, it's so strange. We have a diversity problem. We don't know what happened. It is maybe a pipeline problem. Maybe it's a culture problem, but we just don't know. They know. Uh, it is gender imbalanced because they have chosen to keep it gender imbalanced. Uh, so I don't know, it's just sexism. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Uh, in terms of uh, the problem is capitalism. Yes, uh, I do get this question a lot actually. And I, you know, yes, the problem is capitalism. The problem is uh, we have created this system where a few corporations uh, have this enormous wealth. Uh, wealth like has never been seen before in the world. The power is concentrated in the hands of a few. Uh, there is enormous economic inequality. Uh, yes, that is a problem. Uh, one way that I like to think about it is I like to think about, okay, there is this enormous range of problems. There's this whole set of problems, but I can't get paralyzed in the face of, oh my God, it's capitalism. I like to look at what are the smaller problems inside the set of big problems and what can I affect? And also where can I start? So sometimes people look at uh, the field of public interest technology, they look at the problem of algorithmic bias and they say, oh my God, there are so many things to be done. I don't know where to start. I'm just, I'm perplexed and I'm overwhelmed and I could do anything. So I think that the thing is that you should start wherever you want. There are so many problems that need solutions that need working on that anywhere you wanna start is totally great. If you wanna start with policy, that's fantastic. If you want to start with building uh, more socially just technologies, terrific. If you want to start by uh, making the website of your student organization more accessible, that's a great place to start. If you want to start by educating yourself about the uh, spectrum of possibilities, start there. So whatever your interests are, whatever your own starting point is, that's terrific. It all needs doing uh, and start small and work your way up. Thanks, Marta. Does anybody here have a question in the in, uh, the in-person audience that maybe wants to come up and ask? Please, Eunice. No. Hi, um, just I have a question. So we have I have to come up here uh, to ask it. So uh, I know that you you know you work as a programmer yourself, and also like you know you worked as um, as a data journalist um, for many years. So I was wondering like if there was any moment that you felt like you were actually like falling prey to any of these things that you now you know um, study and examine. Just thinking about like your like you know perhaps like you know. Uh, you know, uh, your, you know, your, your experience as part of those institutions. Uh, so thank you for that. And I think you're asking, have I always been perfect? Uh, and the answer is no, no, I have not been. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to, uh, to recognize about unconscious bias is that we all have it. And we're all trying every single day to become better people, but it's a work in progress. None of us are perfect. We're all getting there, but we haven't made it yet. Uh, so we need to forgive ourselves a little bit for things. Uh, and the other thing that's really sneaky about unconscious bias is you can't see it because it's unconscious, right? So I have certainly made missteps. Uh, one of the uh, funniest missteps that I have made uh, is 
uh, when I was 18, I think I was taking this uh, graduate course in uh, information theory. And it was when the web had first launched. Uh, so I'm very old. So back in the, uh, like literally I started college when the internet, when the web launched. Uh, and I, uh, so we were studying the internet and cyberspace and I had to write a paper about the future of the internet. What did I think the future of the internet was going to be? So, you know what I said? I said that I thought that uh, commercial interests were entering the internet space and I thought that the denizens of cyberspace were going to rise up and say, we do not want your commercial entities here. We are free and we do not want your you know, nonsense corporate interests and we're just gonna be indie and I don't even know what. And I was so wrong. I was so, so wrong. I cannot think of a time I've been more wrong about something. Uh, and it really, uh, I think about that moment a lot because I think about the early aspirations that we had for the internet, the early aspirations we had for online culture. Uh, People thought it was going to be this place outside of the reach of government. Uh, people thought it was going to be this place where everybody was going to be equal, where it was going to bring about gender equality, where it didn't matter what color you were or what country you lived in or how much money you had. And guess what? All of these things matter online the same way that they matter offline. And people of color, uh, women get harassed online much more than white people, than men. Uh, you know, inside dating apps, people get rape threats, get uh, all kinds of obscene, uh, obscene photos sent to them. On social media, there's this fantasy that we're going to be able to use algorithms and AI to uh, parcel of the content. But no, actually what's happening is when something disgusting is on social media, like, you know, something violent, like a beheading, uh, it gets flagged by a human person who sees it and then it gets sent to an algorithm and then it gets sent to an underpaid worker, a human being who is a commercial content moderator and has to watch this unrelenting stream of filth all day, which with disastrous psychological effects. So there is no way to build a computer program that gets us away from the essential problems of humanity. There's no way to build a computer problem that gets us uh, or that delivers us from being human. Uh, and we are all human. We all make mistakes. Uh, we all have blind spots. Um, and the best thing we can do is kind of recognize that, work to be better and, uh, and move on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, that's a thank you message from John. Is there any other question? Are there any other questions here? I'm on screen. I promise I won't bite. <laughs> And you can also throw the questions into the chat if you like. The, um, well, I, you know, I, I can always come up with questions. <laughs> the, um, because, you know, uh, I mean, you know, like I'm very familiar with your work and, you know, I find it, as I said, like very generative, um, you know, because it kind of like opens up like, you know, a lot of like different ways in which like we can think about technology and society. I should take this off. Um, yeah, um, so one of the things I was like, you know, I had two questions. So one of them is like this global dimension. And uh, one thing I noticed, at least like, you know, um, particularly debates around the ethics, uh, there's a tendency to focus on the US or the West 
and and the, and of course, like you just mentioned, like you know, content moderation. But there are also many, you know, mechanical terms. There are many ways actually, like global inequalities and um, injustices actually um, have become part of like you know this global um, you know process in a way. The kind of like the the AI based, you know, uh, machine learning based innovation. Um, so I was wondering, like you know. Do you, I mean, maybe I'm mistaken because, you know, like you study this, like, you know, like you've been part of these conversations, you know, uh, uh, for a long time. Do you feel that there's a kind of like a West-centeredness um, or kind of like Eurocentrism in the way we think about AI and kind of like, are we also like dismissing or not, maybe like, you know, not paying enough attention to kind of like global um, ramifications of all these things. And I'm saying this like, you know, we think a lot and value our privacy, but also are we thinking about like, you know, you know, other questions about like, kind of like, you know, how people are kind of like forced to, um, you know, the kind of like the, the other like, you know, I guess like my question is perhaps like this, like are we also like, you know, um, are we so much focusing on our like first world problems and I'm so like missing you know, other kinds of things? Are we like kind of like not registering them as a sort of part of our conversations of AI things? Anyway, it was kind of like a possibly like a bunch of different questions together, but yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, and I have I have three three parts to my answer. Uh, one part is about voice assistance, another part is about translation, and another part is about farming. Uh, so I'll try and hit uh, try and hit uh, all three of those. So let me start with uh, language and Eurocentrism inside voice assistance. Uh, I did a story a few years ago about uh, Scottish accents uh, for the uh, Scotland Daily Herald. Uh, and it was about why is Alexa so bad at understanding Scott's accent? Uh, so people uh, in Scotland have a lot of problems using voice assistance because uh, their accent is not understood. Uh, and there are a lot of YouTube videos about this. Uh, and it turns out that it's not just people in Scotland. Uh, anybody without a uh, kind of Wall Street Journal or Oxbridge English accent uh, has trouble being understood by voice assistants. So I looked into why is this happening? And it turns out that Alexa and Siri are trained on uh, particular speech corpuses. And the corpus that Alexa is trained on is uh, Wall Street Journal English corpus and Oxbridge English corpus. So the reason that those two specific accents are understood well and other accents are not understood is because that's what was put into the model. Like that's the training data, right? So it's a pretty simple explanation. Uh, but it is deeply Eurocentric. It is deeply Western focused. And I don't happen to have a problem with it because I grew up in the Northeastern United States and my accent sounds like it does, but I am acutely aware that I'm very privileged to, uh, to be able to use voice assistance without, uh, without too many problems. And I know that not everybody speaks the same way. Uh, one of the great things that one of the great things about the human ear and the human brain is that we can uh, figure out accents. We can translate much better than computers can. Uh, so I take I think about that. I think about the people who want to totally eliminate. Uh, customer service representatives, and they just want to do everything with, uh, with voice. And I think, well, there are going to be a lot of people whose voices are not going to be recognized by the voice assistants, and we actually still need human processes uh, to be there. We need humans answering the phone uh, or on the chat or whatever so that uh, it's actually accessible. 
Uh, I also think uh, about people who are blind. Uh, voice assistants are really great. Uh, Siri and Alexa, in fact, come from uh, assistive technology that was developed for blind people. Uh, but if you are blind and uh, you have an accent that's not recognized by the technology, then the technology is not really uh, benefiting you that much. That's a problem. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to translation uh, and talk about the global dimension of it. Uh, machine translation is really great nowadays compared to what it used to be. Uh, AI transcription is in a pretty impressive place. AI uh, machine translation is in a pretty impressive place. Uh, but the important thing to remember about it is that uh, your brain is still doing a lot of work. So when you put something into Google Translate and it gives you this kind of garbagey thing, but you can pick out a couple of nouns that then you kind of know basic sentence structure and you know the context so you can kind of figure out what the person said. That's amazing, but it's still your brain that's doing the heavy lifting, right? So the computer has not totally replaced your brain. Your brain is still doing really great work there. Uh, and we also need to think about which languages have, uh, have been effectively translated uh, or have been uh, used in order to train the machine translation AI and which languages have not. Uh, so English translation, uh, automated translation, I think is, uh, is much better than say, uh, or translating English is in a better place, a more advanced place than translating say Turkish. Right. And this has implications for uh, social media and for monitoring disinformation on social media because the social media platforms are trying to use algorithms to monitor content uh, and to elevate content uh, to get more eyeballs because using algorithms is a little bit less expensive, they think, than using human beings. Uh, but uh, if you uh, have not invested in, say, algorithms that uh, are looking for misinformation in a particular uh, dialect of a particular language that's spoken in a country, then that misinformation monitoring is not actually happening. So concrete example, uh, if you look at Facebook and you look at Facebook's uh, misinformation uh, and uh, truth monitoring efforts, uh, they will very clearly say that they have uh, disinformation monitoring happening in the US. They have it happening in England, I believe. I think there's a little bit in, uh, in a couple of countries in the EU and in other countries, it's not happening at all. So somebody should fact check me on this. I believe it's something like there are only 17 countries where uh, Facebook is, uh, is actively running uh, kind of defense against misinformation efforts. Uh, and there are a lot more than 17 languages in the world. Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's much bigger than 17. So we need to think about who gets included in the computational solutions that are created, who doesn't get included, what stage is it at uh, in terms of inclusion. And we need to not rush to turn everything over to the algorithms because these are notable known exceptions and it's gonna cause a problem. Oh, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is farming. I just checked my notes. All right, so farming. Uh, in terms of development, uh, there is some interesting stuff going on around uh, AI and farming. So sometimes people ask the question, you know, can we use technology to accelerate development in, uh, in developing countries in the global south? And the answer is that, yes, yeah, sometimes we can, uh, but we need to be careful. So I am, I, I am kind of a, a notable crank 
on the uh, on the topic of self-driving cars. Uh, I think self-driving cars are a terrible idea. I think the technology is really nifty, but uh, it is racist. Uh, they did an experiment out of Georgia Tech where they looked at uh, how well self-driving car software recognizes white people versus how well it recognizes black people. Uh, the self-driving car uh, technology did not recognize darker skinned people as human uh, as much as it recognized lighter skinned people as human. So the cars are racist. Uh, so that's my one problem with them. And But I used to say that I could get behind self-driving tractors. Right, so I thought, all right, uh, a tractor is out in the field and I, I, I really want to be able to find something good to say about autonomous technology. So I was like, all right, I can, I can get behind tractors. And then I was, uh, I was sitting next to a farmer at a dinner one night. It was a tech conference. He like owns a farm or owns a giant, uh, giant like, a factory for putting around hundreds and hundreds of acres in Canada and uh, had a seed genetics company, which is why I was at this tech conference. And I, I told him, I, you know, self-driving tractors, they seem like a really good idea. And he said, yeah, you know, you think it's a really good idea uh, until you own a farm and you remember how often your tractor gets stuck in the mud. I said, what? Mud? I didn't think about mud. And it turns out that when you own a farm, uh, you spend a lot of time like pulling your farm equipment out of the mud where it's gotten stuck. So my idea that, okay, well, we can have these autonomous tractors just running around the field and doing their thing, like was not really grounded in the, uh, in the reality of somebody who was expert in the field. So I think we just need to be really cautious. We need to uh, do a lot of assessment. We need to talk a lot to people in the field and actually ask, is this something that you need? So farmers in the global South, we need to ask, do you need AI in your field or do you just need better irrigation? Do you just need maybe steady sources of electricity? Is that maybe something we could, uh, we could do before? we start creating these fancy AI solutions. Great, thank you. Just one uh, little announcement. Uh, um, please do not like turn on your uh, Zoom or your phone or your devices. I think this is kind of creating some kind of echo here. Uh, really appreciate it, thank you. Um, yeah, that's something wrong. Yeah, that's something wrong. All right, so it looks like we have another question in the chat. Uh, Ishan asks, when considering social justice, or while considering social justice, we have to think about what happens to all the people who will lose their jobs when we replace them with AI-based technology, say, replacing factory floor workers with industrial robots. How is the scientific community planning to tackle this issue? That is a great question. Uh, this fantasy of replacing workers with robots is a very, very common fantasy. Uh, it is a little short-sighted. Uh, so I say this as a fan of automation. Uh, I teach a book sometimes called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Uh, I am a huge fan of automating boring things. Uh, if you are not uh, already automating your email filtering, you should absolutely do it. It will make your life a thousand times easier uh, and uh, you will not make anybody lose their job in the process. So that's great. Uh, so let's look at the fantasy of replacing factory workers with robots. Uh, there is a really great Charlie Chaplin film called Modern Times. Uh, where he is a factory worker and uh, he's on the assembly line and they bring in a, uh, they bring in a robot that is designed to feed the factory worker so that they don't have to leave the assembly line for lunch. Uh, they can just stand there and keep working. And you should, I wish I had the clip right at hand because it's incredible. Uh, and the robot goes all crazy and Charlie Chaplin is very funny. Uh, so we need to think about what's actually going on here. 
robots need maintenance. Robots break. Uh, yes, you might replace a human worker with a robot, but you're going to then have to have somebody to monitor and repair the robot. Uh, you're going to need to replace the robot. The robot's going to become more expensive to replace. Uh, so it's not always uh, an unmitigated good to put in automation instead of human beings. Sometimes automation is called for, sometimes it's not. Uh, there is an argument in the scientific community that uh, says that, well, everybody is going to be replaced by robots and then we're going to have universal guaranteed income that is going to uh, replace uh, actual wages. Uh, universal guaranteed income is, again, a fantastic and fun thing to talk about. Uh, but the programs that I've seen for universal guaranteed income are not actually enough income to live on. Uh, so it's things like giving people $500 a month, which is terrific. I would not turn down $500 a month, but $500 a month is not actually enough to live on. Uh, we have had you know, a uh, kind of universal guaranteed income uh, in the US before, it was called welfare. People hate, uh, people, many people have spent years trying to dismantle the welfare system. Uh, so I, I just think it's unrealistic to, uh, to pretend that we are on the verge of universal guaranteed income so that uh, you know, we can replace lost wages. Um, there is also a promise often uh, in the automation, among the automation folks that, oh yeah, we're going to automate things and then we're going to make uh, more better jobs for people around the automation and that rarely happens. So I think just be skeptical of those claims as well. Thank you. I think we, uh, we don't have much time, I guess, left, right? One, one more question, okay. Um, so um, a, a question uh, from the audience here. Uh, how has your work in the, in the study of AI and social justice changed your perspective on other non-AI criminal systems, uh, uh, like law, uh, academic systems, access to infrastructure, et cetera? Academic systems, access to infrastructure, et cetera. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important in understanding AI ethics is understanding the material reality of the computer. Uh, so one of the things I do in my class is uh, we get an old computer and we take it apart. And often my students are kind of intimidated by taking apart a computer. They've never uh, had the experience before of taking apart a computer because uh, you know, they're used to using a phone or an iPad, which you, know, you can't really take it apart and look under the hood. Uh, if you've ever built a gaming computer though, you know that you can kind of tinker with these things and you can optimize them the same way you can tinker with a car. So I think the starting with the material reality of the computer is really fun. Uh, and it helps you understand how all these systems are put together so that you can interrogate the systems and so that you can push back against algorithmic decisions. So you can feel empowered to say, all right, this is just a machine and I understand how machine works. Machines can make mistakes and let's investigate what's going wrong. Uh, and I like to scale that up and also to think about computational infrastructure. There's a really great book by Ingrid Barrington called Networks of New York. Uh, and it explains exactly what the network infrastructure of New York City looks like. Uh, there are little sketches of surveillance cameras. What do they look like? You know, she translates uh, what's happening uh, with those uh, spray painted, uh, you know, you walk down the street and you'll see like colors and lines spray painted on the sidewalk and it has something to do with cable or television or something, but you don't really know what. She actually decodes these, uh, these blazes on the street. So the same way that you understand, like when you start hiking, you understand what the blazes mean on the trail. Uh, you can understand what the blazes mean on the street and it's all connected. So in New York City, for example, uh, our internet infrastructure is using the same 
uh, tunnels and pipes and buildings as the telegraph infrastructure. So these giant buildings were built, you can recognize them because they have no windows, right? They were built for uh, telegraph lines and they've been repurposed by Google, Facebook, Amazon uh, for our high-speed internet infrastructure uh, because you know the pipes and the tubes were already laid under the street. So you, it's much easier to run a wire through an existing tube than it is to tear up the street in New York City and lay down a new wire or a new tube. Uh, so it's really fascinating to understand how all of these things fit together uh, and how we're living inside this very intricate system that is a product of really amazing uh, human creativity uh, that has uh, that has persisted through the ages. And yet this really complex and magnificent system is subject to human vulnerabilities, is subject to the weather. So for example, there's a transatlantic cable line that uh, is the reason that we have internet uh, between the US and other places because there's actually a cable running under the sea. And you know what attacks the cable under the sea sometimes? Sharks. Sharks like to gnaw on the undersea cable. This is another thing you can find on YouTube. Uh, and the reason that my internet goes out in the bad weather is because like it's physical infrastructure. So I think that looking at uh, how things work is a really great way of engaging in higher level, uh, higher level inquiry around public interest technology. So thanks for that question. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, all right, uh, well, uh, I think it's uh, we turned it now. Thank you so much, Meredith. Uh, this was great. Uh, this really was really terrific. Thank you so much, too. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you, WPI community. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming to the talk. Uh,